Well, g'day. Uh, grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, firstly, thank you, Nathan, for uh, your work and witness, uh, but also this opportunity. For those who don't know me, my name is Jared McKenna. And uh, Nathan has given me 15 to 20 minutes for this teaching. Some of you will know that um, for years I've been a pastor in charismatic and Pentecostal uh, spaces, despite, um, uh, or um, not despite, maybe, and uh, my deep love of uh, a contemplative prayer um, and, and liturgy. And Nathan and I recently spent time together last uh, was at a, a national liturgy um, conference where we were keynoting. Um, and uh, it could be true to say that I have given altar calls that are longer than the amount of time that we have together. So maybe I'll cut to it. Um, I'm so pleased to have this particular text. Um, and before uh, we pause in prayer, I would like to ask a question. What comes to mind for you when you hear verse six in particular? Do not give to dogs what is sacred. Do not throw your pearls to pigs. If you do, they may trample them under their feet and turn and tear you to pieces. Let me pray. Lord, while talking about dogs and pigs, we ask that we might have a fresh revelation of the lamb who was slain, who was conquered. We want our lives to declare worthy is the lamb to receive all glory, honor and praise. We long to magnify your name. We long for your praise to be in our lives and on our lips. We want our boast to be in you and the kind of power that you have to transform, that the oppressed do hear that and rejoice. So, Lord, keep us from anything that would be anything other than Jesus. Take this time. Add your spirit to it in such ways that it would pierce our hearts and transform our lives, that your love may be embodied by your people, and that it might heal those that are hurting. We pray this now in the precious and mighty name of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And those who love God and seek to love God more said, Amen. Friends, I don't know how you answer that initial question about that text. But context is everything. A text without a context is a sure sign we're being conned. And the context of you dreaming about an elephant is very different if you're a, a 12 year old boy who makes money off tourists in Phnom Penh by placing people upon the family's elephant and walking them around. Or if you're a 12 year old boy in Perth who's just watched your father stampeded at the Perth Zoo. If you dream of elephants out of those two different experiences, you have two very different associations. Uh, in the New Testament, in the Second Temple Jewish period, we find lots of different imagery around animals. In my prayer, I mentioned um, uh, the, the Lamb of God. Uh, I mean, our Lord refers to um, Herod as a fox. Uh, he's clearly not saying that um, he's got the hots for Herod, but in fact is calling out um, uh, that kind of power and that kind of lording over others and how destructive and manipulative and toxic it is for ordinary people. Our Lord himself refers uh, to his own ministry and his own heart that he wished that he could um, gather them like a mother hen. I don't know if you've ever had chickens before. Um, I've spent most of my adult life living in intentional Christian communes and uh, we've had um, any number of chickens um, uh, and, and varieties, which I could spend a lot of time on, but I won't. Uh, but we name chickens for heroes of ours, like Elizabeth McAllister and Thomas Merton and Philip Berrigan and um, uh, uh, Ellie Wiesel. And um, I mean, like w w these heroes of ours. And if you've held a hen and you know the way that when you watch a hen with the chicks will actually cover, and the imagery being that of uh, if a fire was to pass over that a hen would give of its own life to protect the hen's chicks. 
we start to get into the imagination of what animals meant for people in this setting. Um, our Lord is about to later in this chapter talk about wolves and sheep. And one of the things that marks wolves from sheep, even if wolves are in sheep's clothing, is that they devour others and prey upon others. And these are little things that um, are powerful symbols for people out of that context. And here we have an instance in verse six where we hear dogs, and pigs. And most of us sit with that initial question about how do you hear talk of dogs and pigs? And a lot of us, because of the magisterial reformers, Calvin and Luther went with um, Augustine or Augustine, depending on what school um, yeah, you went through, that North African theologian that's had so much impact on the Western church. And his take on this text was basically don't waste your evangelistic efforts on those who aren't interested. Um, you, you know, uh, be ready to give an answer for the hope that you have, but if they're not asking, maybe there's nothing in your life that provokes questions and don't waste time with those who aren't interested. And of course, there's, there's some spiritual wisdom in that. But if I was to put a title on this text with the short amount of time that we have left, I'd be tempted to call this sermon contemplative spiritual warfare. In fact, uh, uh, some of the traditions that um, have formed me, you would turn to the person that you were next to in this part of the sermon and you'd repeat the title. And so you'd say neighbor, you might be social distancing. Maybe you want to text somebody and say neighbor, contemplative spiritual warfare. Sometimes, uh, that follows on with a particular sentence, which is going to sum up the whole sermon. And if I was going to do that, I'd be tempted to ask you to turn to your, your neighbours, either virtually uh, or in person, uh, while social distancing, of course, particularly for um, uh, those of our friends in Melbourne itself, and say, friends, we can't follow the lamb if we're going to capitulate to pig powers and dog domination. Now, some of you already are asking, Jared, what does contemplative spiritual warfare have to do with pigs and dogs? And Jared, what's this talk of domination and powers when I don't see this in the text? Surely this text is just about a teaching around judgment. Surely this text can simply be summed up as don't condemn and instead discern and discern in such ways that are humble enough to do that depth psychology work where you're able to identify that the very thing which blinds you is that little thing that you see in the eye of your sister or brother. Surely that's the teaching. Surely that sums it up. I'm more and more convinced that if we miss verse six and what verse six is about in the context of second temple um, rabbinical teachings and the way that they talk about dogs and pigs, we will instead think that, um, to engage in spiritual warfare will go first to Ephesians and then to Jesus instead of from Jesus to Ephesians. And I don't want to take away that our weapons, um, that our battle is not against flesh and blood, that our wrestle is not against flesh and blood, uh, that it's against the principalities and powers and authorities of this dark age. But if we miss how Jesus names principalities and powers, we might fall into the Frank Peretti um, uh, uh, pop Christianity what my friend Brian Zahn calls the easy cheesy cotton Christianity form of spiritual warfare, that it's the demon of fat on my shoulder. Um, that means that, you know, my gym membership has lapsed again, or um, uh, it, it, it's the, um, it, I mean, you name it, the kind of ridiculous things that sometimes pass, passes in charismatic and Pentecostal circles that's completely ungrounded from realities that Jesus is first naming here, um, realities that took his life, are realities that took the Apostles Paul's life. And if we're to speak seriously about these dynamics, both in ourselves and in our world, what it is to pause and slow down in such a way that we realise that um, contemplative prayer is not about thinking differently as much as it is about seeing differently. And in fact, even the word in English, um, uh, contemplation, refers to a scene, uh, to, to be able to see. Clearly, this text, verses 1 through to 5, is about what blinds our ability to see. 
our Lord powerfully uses imagery of logs and then connects it to specks. What it is to have planks and logs. We might be able to say pig planks without first connecting how that fits together with dogs and pigs. Or we might be able to say um, dog logs without yet connecting how that fits together. But I am convinced that if we read Jesus' teachings, verse 6, in the context of the larger rabbinical teachings around dogs and pigs, we can start to connect that this issue around judgment is the difference between condemnation and discernment. And what we're being called to is a kind of clear vision where we can see God clearly because we see God fully revealed to us in Christ Jesus, that we might be able to see ourselves realistically with the kind of compassion that God has for us. I'm convinced when the Apostle Paul in Romans 2, and maybe I'll read it for you just so, um, I'm convinced that um, uh, Paul's referencing of the circulation of what would later become the teachings we know as the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew's Gospel um, throughout the book of Romans shows up in Romans 2 verse 1, not just Romans 12 where people um, might be tempted to go when thinking about the Sermon on the Mount. Romans 2 verse 1 reads, you therefore have no excuse, you, you who pass judgment on someone else, for at whatever point you judge the other, you are condemning yourself because you pass judgment, do the same thing. It goes on to say, verse 4, Or do you show contempt for the riches of God's kindness, tolerance and patience, not realising that God's kindness, that has said, leads you towards repentance? I'm convinced if we slow down and realise that this is about seeing differently, realise that the very things that trigger us about others and those of us who have lived in um, uh, neo-monastic or monastic um, uh, settings or in any tight form of community, um, those of us who are familiar with Thomas Merton's writings and, and know that Thomas Merton with his spiritual director, one of the things that he was often bringing up is not how he was frustrated with others, but how others were just so frustrated living with him. That it is something in the way that we're formed in our societies that I would say is about the dog domination that we're formed in, that is about the pig powers that we're formed in, that means that we project onto others, not just our potential, but also our problems. And our Lord is asking for the kind of seeing where we do the humble business of removing what blinds us so that we actually can be of service from the place of humility to sisters and brothers who struggle with the same things. But the toxicity of condemnation is removed and what it replaced with is a humility of knowing our own struggles and the kindness that comes from actually realising we have not been condemned. It's almost built into this teaching is the same measure that we use against others is like the, um, the amount of space that we leave for grace to get at us. That same way that we look at others, well, then we will be viewed through. That there is something about the very dynamics of our soul that when we close in and become bitter, we end up projecting that onto others and generating that from ourselves. So obviously the next question is, Jared, are you watching the time? Uh, are you aware how much time you've got left? And I'm checking as we speak, look at this. We're at 14 minutes. Friends, we're landing. But Jared, you haven't given away like what is pig powers? What is um, dog domination? You're about to land this sermon and we still don't know where you're going with this. And some scholars will say this is what's actually happening in terms of the author of Matthew's gospel, or even Jesus in his teaching, that it's almost like Jesus too has ADD, and he hasn't quite landed uh, this thing, and he's coming into uh, what will be three attempts to end the Sermon on the Mount, and uh, randomly, uh, whether it's our Lord himself or whether it's just 
in who recorded these teachings in, in Matthew's gospel, they've got this random line in verse six that they're not sure, does it connect with seven through to 12 or does it connect to one through to six? And Jared, you've spent most of your time alluding to this without actually opening up what it's about. You've hinted at contemplative spiritual warfare. You've talked about that we can't follow the lamb without dealing with pig powers and uh, dog domination. So where are you going? If we're to pay any attention at all to how rabbinical teachers at the time talked about dogs, what is clear across all of them is that dogs were a way of talking about other nations, Gentiles, us. I mean, my mum's side of the family are Ashkenazi Jews, but um, uh, I mean, no Orthodox uh, Jew is gonna take me as Jewish. Uh, unless we've come from a Jewish background, we are all outsiders as we come to this. So if we were to jump into Matthew chapter 15 and uh, the story of the Canaanite woman, which is fascinating considering at the time it would be considered a Seraphonician woman, which is used in other synoptic gospels. Um, but that's a different sermon for a, a different time. Um, uh, we don't have time to upgrade your sermon and supersize it. So uh, let's be streamlined with this. We have one instance there when Jesus refers to dogs as well. And uh, the woman uh, responds, but do not even dogs deserve the crumbs from the table, which again is clearly in, in this outsider territory, there's talk of dogs, talk of Gentiles, those who have got power, those from another gospel, we know that um, uh, financially, this woman who has a demon possessed child is doing quite well. And so the power dynamics is Jesus's people is suffering He's an outsider who has more privilege, if we want to use that language, um, than our Lord does. And she comes to him asking from him and he talks about Gentiles and his default language for that is dogs. Okay, Jared, we can see that in rabbinical teachings at the time. And we've got uh, that example in, in terms of later on in, in Matthew's gospel. But what do we do with the pig stuff? What's this whole pig language about? Well, in the next chapter on, and you might be more familiar with it in Mark 5 in terms of um, uh, the demon possess, uh, the demoniac, um, the garrison. Uh, um, but in Matthew 8, of course, there's a very similar story or the story is told in a different way where there's actually two demoniacs. And again, there's talk of pigs. But because it is simpler in Mark's gospel, maybe I'll draw the analogy from there because in Mark's gospel, it becomes so clear. Again, we are in pagan territory. We are outside of um, Jewish turf. And here is an area where the coins at the time would literally have a hog on it. The Roman coins, the currency of those who were occupying, uh, literally had that. It was on the insignia of um, the legion which was occupying, the army which was occupying. In Mark's gospel, the question is asked, what is your name? And the demons reply, we are legion. Legion, of course, being the term that is used about a Roman military. And then uh, Jesus casts out commands um, uh, like a military uh, commander, these, this army uh, to go into the pigs and then the pigs charge the same language that is used uh, into the sea both in Matthew 8 and in Mark 5, the term that is used of pigs is herd. My mate Chad Myers points out that pigs don't move in herds. You don't talk about a group of pigs as herds, but what you do talk about that way is the Roman Empire in terms of Roman soldiers, in terms of a legion is referred to with the plural term of herd. What is interesting in terms of rabbinical teaching at the time is herd is also a way of describing what well, rather pigs is also a way of, of describing the Roman empire. So if dogs are Gentile powers in general, pigs are the Roman empire in particular. And here we have a teaching on pigs and dogs or I think we should helpfully summarize um, dog domination as the dynamic and pig powers. And this teaching about ask, seek, knock, who are we asking from? 
Who are we seeking from? Who are we knocking, hoping to have the door open to us by? And then it's all summed up in doing to, do unto others as you'd have them do unto you. This summarizes the law and the prophets. So if we take seriously what it is to remove the log from our own eye so that we can be a help to one another to remove specks and then connect it to this teaching around don't give to pagan powers our allegiance, which should be to Christ alone. Our Lord in the desert replies to the enemy by saying, worship the Lord your God and serve him only. I am sure that this little text that seems so random to so many isn't Jesus going off topic, but Jesus grounding the realities of how we come to see clearly and the issues around seeing in ways that condemn versus seeing in ways that discern. And if we look to the pig powers, the domination of dog systems in our world for ways to answer our prayers, we'll end up not doing onto others, imaginatively, empathetically, entering into the experience of others, but instead doing onto others what we hope they wouldn't do onto us, doing onto others what pig powers and dog domination need from us for us to get ahead. This past week, we have seen um, worship leaders from some of the most popular worship ministries in the world lead worship in places where George Floyd was killed. It's important that we don't judge these individuals, that we don't fall into the patterns of scapegoating that would make it easy to pray prayers. Thank you, God, that I'm not like them. It's important instead we discern and leave condemnation behind. If we get stuck in the scapegoating, we get stuck in the very dynamics that make it us unable to see past the log in our own eyes. It makes us unable to discern the powers which actually play in our own hearts, in our own imaginations. Some of you might have noticed that just under Dorothy Day here, um, just next to Martin Luther King, uh, here is Chuck D. Um, um, some of you might have grown up public enemy fans like me. They're great. Um, hit from 1989, Fight the Powers That Be. I found my 10-year-old um, misquoting it uh, just two weeks back where he was saying, fight the powers in me. And I was like, I think he's onto something. When these worship leaders um, go to the place where F George Floyd was murdered and literally over the top of their laments of, um, sorry, the laments of the community and the family who have lost their friend. Worship leaders come in and play their songs from elsewhere, drowning out their lament with their praise. We realise that there has been no discerning of the dog domination game and that pig powers are running rife. And when these worship leaders also organise photo opportunities with Donald Trump, without any critique of the narcissistic neo-fascist realities of his administration that come at the cost of the poor and the expense of the earth in our ecological crisis, we realise that we have removed verse 6 from this teaching, that we don't know what to do with talk of dogs or pigs. And with that in mind this week, I wrote this, and I'd like to, to land on this. My hope is in spelling out what are the dog powers and what is the, the pig domination games that we will be able to, in our own context, remove logs that we can see clearly and realize that contemplative spiritual warfare is removing that in us, which we wish to call out out there. This was my response. To my friend, Danielle, who stood with the sign from Amos 5, 23 to 24, away with your noisy hymns of praise. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Instead, I want a flood of justice, an endless river of righteous living.
she held that sign while surrounded by these who came to drown out the lament of others. And I simply wrote this. When worship leaders provide the background music for Trump's brand of white supremacy, every Christian needs to come to Jesus moment. Discernment is an essential part of discipleship. If you cannot discern between the pig forces that dehumanize and the dog powers that dominate versus the spirit of God who humanizes and delivers from all domination, can we really be disciples of Jesus of Nazareth? We will end up calling what calling holy what is horrific. We'll end up blaspheming the precious name of Jesus by blessing injustice. If the church loses its Christ-likeness, it is good for nothing and to be thrown out and it will be trampled by the forces it sold its soul to, the very forces it went asking, seeking and knocking. Let's be clear. The devil quoting the Bible is nothing new. The powers that killed my Lord using Christian symbols is nothing new. Demons posing as angels of light is nothing new. For 1700 years since the church got into bed with empire, we've had Christian symbols used to promote what Jesus came to confront, was crucified by and conquered through a suffering love. We need to stop asking, is it Christian? Hymns hummed while going to war, land stolen in the shadow of crosses, weekly tithers working as attendees in gas chambers, Sunday picnics while watching lynching, the bombing, the blessing of bombings dropped on Hiroshima, sermons preached to destroy the personhood of others, speaking at Christian conferences while locking up children in indefinite detention, attending revival meetings while disregarding the poor, prayers prayed before doing the devil's work. None of this is new. The question is not, is it Christian? The question is, is it Christ-like? The devil can't imitate Calvary light love that comes as costly solidarity, refusing to conform to the dehumanizing pattern of dog domination, pig oppression, all evil and injustice. The Bible says the son of God was revealed for this purpose to destroy the works of the devil. If we are unable to discern the dog domination and the pig powers, we are unable to witness to the one who destroys that power, including white supremacy. Even if we sing songs, worship songs, while calling ourselves Christian. Friends, if verse 12 sums up discernment, the altar call today is to go and do unto others, imaginatively, empathetically entering into their experiences to such an extent that we can understand what we would want to have done to us if we were them. My hope is that in exploring this, we've seen how God has done unto us what we did not deserve and could not do by ourselves, And yet God has not condemned us, but brought us into a discernment that is the judgment that John sums up like this. This is the verdict. This is the judgment. If you want, this is contemplative spiritual warfare. Love, light, has come into the world, but we love darkness. The altar call is to judge not, remove the plank, that we might be of help to others, discern the principalities and powers, and move into the light. Lord, may you add a blessing to the hearing, and please, Lord, the doing of your word. Amen. Thanks, friends.